we begin to have this opportunity to teach by association, which is this next principle. It's not anything new because the Great Commission actually begins in the first chapter of Genesis, verse 28, when Jesus, when, when God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And certainly from the very beginning, God planned to gather the nations to praise Him. That has always been His objective. Adam and Eve, though, failed in that opportunity. They were deceived by Satan, but they yielded to the temptation of wanting their own way. And in that act of disobedience and rebellion, it proved their faithlessness, and they were thrust out from the garden. And that is a problem that we've been living with ever since. And yet the model that Christ, that Jesus wanted us to follow was already implemented in the human race, in the family. For making disciples is like raising kids. Unfortunately, our forebearers in the garden failed in that opportunity. But the principle of being together has been well established. So that even now, if we reflect upon the influences that have made us what we are, much of it will be traced back to those early influences growing up as a child. That's where we have our greatest education. Of course, the tragedy is so often our families are dysfunctional and we don't have the encouragement and the, the, the direction needed by children who are still very susceptible for direction from parents. And we grow up with those limitations still impressed upon us. You don't have to go and get a PhD in counseling or psychology to recognize those early influences upon our life really form our value system. Now those values can be changed later, but still we reflect those influences even today. But the example of the family has been set before us as a way that we make disciples so that everyone who is born has that privilege to learn from others and at the same time when you reach maturity to begin to teach others what you have learned. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's creating a relationship with a few disciples much like what we would call a family. He teaches them to think of each other as brother and sister in the kingdom and to think of God as the Father in heaven. Even the church is identified as the family of God. There's no reason why anyone then cannot fulfill the Great Commission because we've all had the, about the same opportunity growing up in a family to learn the principles of discipleship. But I know what many of you will say. You don't understand my situation. I really felt that I was put down, I was alienated, I was, I was repressed, even maybe abused growing up. But that's no excuse for fulfilling the commandment of God. But here's how you can become the smartest person on earth. Identify what went wrong growing up as a child. Then you can correct it. And if you will learn from your failure, there's no end to what you can learn.
Everybody here then has that potential of reflecting upon your experience and seeing what was right that you want to emulate. What was wrong you can correct. But the opportunity to learn to make disciples is inherent in the human race. That's why there's no excuse for any of us failing to obey our Lord's command. And you see this with Jesus. Even though he often preached to crowds, his life focused on a few men who were following him. You see proprietors here, of course, in this kind of a close fellowship. His disciples were all, that is the close disciples, the twelve, were all about his same age, same sex. Not that others were excluded, but that was the most normal relationship. And that's usually the case with our experience as well. We disciple where it is most natural, where it is normal, where it seems to be the way that God has just ordered our steps to walk in them. For there are no mistakes. It all fits into God's plan that had been determined from the beginning. And that's the excitement about following in His way. There's always something more to learn. He's not finished with any of us yet. But what Jesus did with His disciples certainly impresses us how we need to be with those that are learning. They walked together with Jesus. They went to the synagogue and the temple together. There were some times they would go to the mountain or to the, to the desert together on a retreat. One time they went up to Tyre, about 130 miles from where Jesus was born. It's, as far as we know, the longest trip He ever took on earth. So if you've traveled more than 130 miles, you've already traveled more than Jesus did. You see, traveling around the world is not the commission to reach the nations. You begin where you are, and those who catch this vision will multiply where they are, and they will pass the word along. Someday the world will be reached. That's always our objective. But most of us are not going to be called in a special way as an overseas missionary, though we are grateful for those who have that call. But do not think for a moment you are excused from reaching the world because you are not a missionary in cross-cultural circumstance. This is a command to the whole church. And as you'll notice too, it's not limited to the priesthood of Jesus' day. There were a lot of priests. As far as we know, none of them were in the immediate group that Jesus had around him. Uh, they were just ordinary people, much like us, businessmen. One was a tax collector. Some were fishermen. Jesus Himself was a carpenter. They were not highly trained in the theological schools of their day. They had universities even at that time, but none of them, as far as we know, were university graduates. Not to put that down, I've spent my life on the campus. But I'm simply saying because you don't have some special education or some clerical identity, you are excused from the Great Commission. But you have a few people around you. They can learn the way of the Lord by following you. And you do it by simply being together. And that's the way children learn most naturally. Where we are every day then, in a way, is a school. It is a place where we are being impressed by what we hear and especially by what we see. The home then is going to be a model. 
And that's why in our homes we should seek as best we can to bring into that small fellowship the teaching of Christ. Certainly we can pray around the table. That's, I think, expected. But we could also have a time during the day when we can read the Bible together, pray together, maybe at the breakfast hour, maybe in the evening before bed. We used to call this the old family altar. And I know now with pressure so, so difficult, it's hard to get everybody together at the same time, especially young people. Kids in high school seem to be the busiest people on earth. But trying to use the advantage we have while we are together as a family to make disciples. Oh, let's not miss the obvious. That's what we're saying about the Great Commission. There's nothing new here that's being taught. This is simply the way God has structured the universe. It's the way that all of us can live, and we live in fellowship with others. I suppose one of the most natural ways is just to arrange to do things together. When you go to the ball game, it's a lot more fun if you go with somebody else. Or go shopping. That's what my wife's favorite trait is. Or have a round of golf. Who would ever play golf unless they knew they were fulfilling the Great Commission? <laughs> now some of you laugh, but why would you do anything unless it was commanded by God? You see, golf is made for this purpose. <laughs> and that's a beautiful way to have fellowship. And if you want to, you can get down on about hole 14 and have a prayer meeting. That force them behind, just wave them on. Oh, the principle of just being together. That's how disciples are made. And if you would look back into your own experience and try to identify persons that have been the most powerful influence on your body, it likely would not be some that are in the prominent positions of society. Perhaps not even the church, but I expect it would include family, close friends, as well as Sunday school teachers and other leaders of the church. But this is where discipleship takes form every day. Now to give some structure to it, I suggest that you get involved in some kind of a small group where at least you can ask a question. It's not often that you hear a question raised in a worship service in church. I've only had it happen once in my life and I was taken by such surprise I didn't even know what to say <laughs> except to say this man who asked, he said, preacher I want to get saved and I, I was so dumb I said, well when I finish this sermon let's pray about it. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I'll never do it again. I should have stopped there. First things go first when you seek the Lord. But in a small group you can ask questions and you can see if you can understand it. You don't have to take it out on your wife or your husband when you get back home if the preacher didn't make sense. Ask somebody in the small group. Thankfully your Sunday school class gives you a chance to ask a question. And that's why we need our Sunday school classes. But it may be just a little Bible study that meets during the week. Or it could be a prayer cell. And I found in my own experience, little groups have been a great help in this principle of giving me an opportunity to be together with people who will pray for me and teach me. I started that right after I came to faith clearly as a student at the university down in Texas. And through the years, I've found ways to get with a few people who will join me in seeking the kingdom. I found on the campus the best way to clear a schedule is at six o'clock in the morning. I don't have much competition then. Now I'm in a little different situation. We met last year at the noon hour for fasting and prayer and Bible study. And I have a group now that's meeting 
on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. We're older people. We can get together. And this group is more for my benefit than it is for them. And one of these dear saints in the group, dear Dr. Kenlaw, he inspires me so much. I need that fellowship. And I hope that you have the opportunity to be in some kind of a group every week or every other week when you can get together and pray for each other and read the Word or memorize the Word and find ways to share your needs and pray for one another and so fulfill the law of Christ. It's this principle. And it can be incorporated into the lifestyle of every believer. I think that you still need your larger times of association in the public worship. And there are times when we need to get together in a big football stadium and give a community the witness that we are together in the, in the, in the Christian mission. I've been associated with Billy Graham for many years. And he would be one of the first to agree with the principles that I'm trying to teach here. In fact, I've been doing it all over the world under his sponsorship. Because we know it's not big football stadium rallies or getting on TV and preaching to millions that's going to fulfill the Great Commission. That will give an opportunity for many to hear and encourage them to get involved. But finally, this comes down to an individual relationship with all of us, with a few people. So you're not excluded because you're not a big TV preacher or, or a big football stadium evangelist. With a few people, you have a greater opportunity than any of those evangelists have. It's this principle. And of course, you can have some time occasionally when you get together for an extended time of reflection Maybe going out on a retreat together, going fishing together. And something like this when you come together for a teaching time. But the principle is just being together. It's so simple, we often overlook. But in this process, of course, you're learning, which means that you need to put into practice what you have discovered. And so there comes the principle of consecration. 